Hello, good evening and welcome. I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to our the, a continuing series of conversations with some of the incredibly inspiring women at Imperial College London. I wanna thank Pinky Lulani and Marty Wickstrom for their continued support for this series and for con connecting us to their wonderful networks of, of friends. Uh, welcome to all of you. Welcome back to many of you who've been following us and welcome to new, uh, new guests joining us this evening. Imperial College London is indeed one of the world's greatest universities focusing on science, engineering, medicine, and business. We have approximately 20,000 students and 8,000 staff pursuing the forefront of their fields. I'm excited to say that our research discoveries are ever more present in the news and in our teaching, and we learn new things every day from the youngest members of our community. Thus, in this series, we decided to connect some of our breathtaking career moments with the ideas and aspirations of our younger colleagues and students. Tonight, we will be hearing some of our brilliant women working on the global challenge of antimicrobial resistance and drug-resistant infection. Called the slower epidemic, antimicrobial resistance is an increasing threat to patients throughout the world. According to the CDC, each year in the U.S. alone, at least 2.8 million people get an antibiotic-resistant infection, and more than, more than 35,000 people die from them. As with most complex problems, we benefit from inspiring top researchers and innovators from across disciplines to bring their expertise to the problem. This is just what we have done at Imperial College London with a formation by Alison Holmes of the Antimicrobial Resistance Collaborative, where colleagues from across campus began working together on this critically important threat. So let me begin by introducing our luminaries and introduce Alison Holmes. She is a professor of infectious diseases and director of the NIHR Health Protection Research Unit in Healthcare Associated Infections and AMR. And she's the head of the Center for Antimicrobial Optimization at Imperial College London. She is also the current president of the International Society for Infectious Diseases. Allison is an NIHR senior investigator and has had a long standing career in the NHS. She serves on WHO expert groups related to antimicrobial use, AMR, infection prevention, sepsis, and COVID-19. At Imperial College, she leads a large international multidisciplinary infectious disease research program, including collaborative programs funded by NIHR, ESRC, UKRI, and Wellcome Trust on the improved management and prevention of infections, particularly focusing on addressing antimicrobial resistance and the optimizing of antimicrobial use through the integration of social sciences, the application of innovative approaches and technologies and the development of precision medicine. We are joined by two future luminaries working with Allison. Uh, first, Alita Yanakaita is an Imperial College Research Fellow in Bacterial Genomics and Epidemiology at the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology and Research Lead for Priority Pathogens Theme in the National Institute of Health Research and Health Protection Research Unit in Healthcare Associated Infection and Antimicrobial Resistance. Her research focuses on transmission and antimicrobial resistance of bacterial infections that are transmitted within our hospitals and that could be prevented through vaccination. Alita is focusing on the disease group B streptococcus, where she is using whole genome sequencing bioinformatic analyses, and molecular biology techniques to inform on evolution, mother-to-baby transmission, and antimicrobial resistance patterns of this pathogen. Alita also leads genomic work investigating outbreaks and pathogenicity of other bacterial pathogens. Also, Nina Zhu is the research lead for the population health and policy theme in the National Institute of Health Research Health Protection Research Unit in healthcare associated infection and antimicrobial resistance. Nina's research primarily focuses on applying system dynamics modeling to examine
decision-making processes to inform design, implementation, and evaluation of antimicrobial stewardship interventions. She is the moderate and quantitative, quantitative data analyst of the ESRC-funded multinational research project, ASPIRES, studying the impact on patient health systems and health economic outcomes of interventions proposed to optimize antibiotic use along surgical pathways. Today, we will see how these impressive women are helping us battle AMR and have come to be the scientists they are today and where they are heading. Please send your questions in and our team will pull them together for our discussion. So first, Allison, you are our champion uh, of this brand new collaborative, the Antimicrobial Research Collaborative. And you've made great advances in microbial research working across disciplines. Can you tell us a bit about how um, AMR comes about and why AMR is such a passion for you and share your aha moments from your career in this field, please. Certainly, and thank you so much, Alice, and it's really great to see you. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, antimicrobial resistance to um, healthcare and to medicine is almost like what climate change is to the environment. Um, and to the world and society. So um, that's kind of the background to our real interest and why we think it's so important. Um, and, and also my background, I, I'm also a, a medic. I'm an infectious diseases physician and it's um, absolutely not something that is kind of out there you know, in the future, it's tangible, it's real, and it's it's a real threat. Um, and uh, and in terms of kind of, uh, you, you asked about aha moments. Well, I am um, uh, so so. I'm, I have three. I I'm, I'll share with you. I mean, my my first one was within healthcare, and it was it was quite a few years ago now, and I I. I'd come back from a fellowship for a few years in the US and I'd come back to work in the UK. And, um, you know, it was obvious that there needed to be urgent attention on the issue of how we use antibiotics within acute healthcare um, and more broadly in healthcare um, and how we needed to really, really focus on preventing the transmission of, and acquisition of infections within healthcare, and that these really go together. And they were not receiving enough airtime in terms of research attention, and also um, in terms of kind of multidisciplinary approaches. So something really needed to be done. It was quite an unpopular area to be involved in, it threatened a lot of practice and how things worked. So it was unpopular and rather lonely to be honest, but we're really lucky. I mean, we had some uh, truly kind of visionary research funding that supported our multidisciplinary um, research proposals. We also were really, um, it, it was very important that we also brought in issues around behavior. And we're delighted, you know, we've got a colleague, Esmita Chirani, who's not here today, but who really kind of pioneered looking at um, behavior in terms of improving, um, improving how we um, manage antibiotics. But we also needed to bring in really good data in hospital epidemiology and microbial genetics into how we look at our healthcare. So that was my first aha moment, which was we need to do something about this and we need to work together. Um, and we're very lucky to have got funding. And as I said, really superb mm -hmm. to get that support. My second one was around working at Imperial and just, you know, surrounded by such brain boxes, fantastic, always outside your area of expertise. And it was, we also received some really nice funding from the um, EPSRC to um, bridge the gap and develop some work across faculties. And, you know, it's just, I've been loving working with my fabulous bioengineering um, colleagues. Um, it's just been fantastic and in electrochemistry and chemistry. So working with Georgia Pantelis, Tony Cast, Danny O'Hare, we're doing such amazing things. And in mathematics with Maurizio Barahona. Yeah, just, just brilliant. And what an opportunity that is, bringing all of those skills together. Um, and, and then 
my last kind of aha moment has been um, something more recent in terms of looking at the kind of global research environment. And this was work that was also supported and driven by the Wellcome Trust, who commissioned us to look at this, which was about how research is being developed and funded and to try and develop a roadmap for this. And whilst the world needs new antibiotics and we need to look at target molecules and everything, that is just not enough. And it should not be the main focus of research because unless we get more bang for our buck with our existing agents, it doesn't matter which ones will come along. And really, we're not really seeing much coming along at all. Um, so there's many opportunities to optimize how we use um, antimicrobials um, and many technologies and many approaches, which actually will be far more equitable for the world in terms of the populations that really need effective antibiotics and access to them. So the kind of research needs to shift more towards how can we use them better rather than, you know, let's look at new agents, let's look at new agents. Um, so those are my three three moments, Alice. Thank you. So that's that's very inspiring. And you you clearly were strongly motivated by the tremendous need. Um, and it's a bit scary to think about. Uh, I think we all hope there's some new new antibiotics out there that are going to save us from this this huge problem. And you suggest that we should be doing um, other things. And, and that's where this multidisciplinary work uh, really comes in. If it's not just searching for new antibiotics, um, uh, tell, tell us a bit more about that optimization. And then I think that might uh, lead into the kind of work Alita and Nina are doing. Yep, certainly. So, so um, in fact, I'll, I'll pick this up from the, the um, perspective of the host or the individual. Um, and then um, Alita absolutely should can pick that up from the, the perspective of the, um, uh, of the bug. Um, so we're, we're trying to think of how can we use um, antibiotics more, um, more in a more targeted way, not just in terms of, of, of how we absolutely use the best antibiotic with the narrowest, um, narrowest range for a particular organism, but actually, how do we use it? You know, it's not one size fits all. If you're elderly or you know, you're a child or you've got burns or you've just had surgery or you've on multiple medication or you've got other illnesses, we need to work, work out how we can use um, antibiotics more effectively in um, not just different populations, but also in different, um, uh, different clinical scenarios and also dynamically. And there are many ways we can do this. And, and you know, I mentioned before about um, how we can use, um, how we can work the engineers and the chemists. And we're doing some really beautiful work with um, artificial intelligence as decision support, as decision support to help um, us in terms of making a diagnosis and what to treat with. And that's been really exciting. Um, and there are many opportunities there. We've also been working on how can you do things at the point of care? At the point of care and in rural and remote and low resource environments, how can you do things as well as in high resource intensive care units? And there's some fantastic technologies. We're developing, um, bi uh, we're developing biosensing, the use of microneedles. Um, um, we've learned from the work in the artificial pancreas and diabetes. We're applying that to antimicrobials. We're trying to develop microneedle patches where we can monitor not only the drug to target it for your particular situation and inform how we um, uh, dose things, but also maybe how you react to infections at the same time. So you can do you can do both. Um, but that's it in terms of the, the, the host side of things, precision prescribing and how we can really use our old drugs, things like penicillin, you know, how can we use that better rather than thinking about some of the other things. But in terms of precision prescribing related to how we know the, um, the microorganism and the genetics of that, Alita is your woman to talk about that. Yes, yes thank you. Uh, Alita, um, personalized prescriptions in medicine is really uh, fascinating and important. And really be interested in how you got interested in microbial genetics and what you're learning from this work that's really informing this type of uh, personalized or stratified medicine. 
Yes. So with bacterial genomics, um, what mostly fascinates me, how you can apply it to investigate, investigate different, different aspects, different research questions. Um, so for example, I'm using uh, bacterial genomics and bioinformatics um, analysis tools to investigate outbreaks within specific settings as well track how particular bacterial pathogens evolve over time, how they spread within particular settings, again, even like, you know, within a particular area or globally as well, by having whole genome sequence of the whole genome of the bacterial pathogen available, you not only get information on what antimicrobial resistance determinants they have, but you always get also get information on the specific pathogenicity factors, specific clone present in your population. Again, it, it helps you to identify, to characterize the pathogen and see how you can apply this information together with some data that uh, my colleagues from multidisciplinary teams are collecting. And we put it together and try to see what is the overall picture and what, what pieces of puzzles we can put together. Uh, when it comes to personalized and optimized treatment, what, what would be very good from the pathogen genomic side that we can know in particular what antibiotics, uh, what treatment the bug is resistant to based on its genetic makeup and as well on a lot of laboratory data that um, research community have tested to prove that certain mutations or certain genes presence confer resistance to particular antibiotics. So then this information can be used by colleagues um, that Allison works on the optimization teams as well. We combine this information again with work that Nina is doing to see overall how these ch things change over time. And of course, as well through genomics, we're able to track the pathogens, potential transmission from person to person and spread beyond that as well as using whole genome sequencing as well in, in COVID pandemic time has proven how useful it can be identifying specific clones, new variants, the emergence of these new, new variants in different countries. So this is, uh, it's true, everyone listening is very uh, familiar now with new variants and mutations. Uh, the same thing happens in these bacteria, and uh, is that how they get around? Sort of like we're worrying about with the virus and the uh, and the vaccine. Um, does it work in the same way with bacteria? So it's similar. Bacteria as a pathogen, of course, is trying to survive whatever pressures we're putting on them. Hence, it'd be like vaccine protection or antibiotic treatments. So bacteria is trying to survive, so it's mutating. It's trying to acquire some new genes to survive that. However, as with, with COVID virus, we know that variants can arise fairly quickly because the genome of the virus is much smaller compared to bacteria. So on average, bacterial genome size can be from approximately 2 million base pairs to six, seven million base pairs. So it takes a little bit longer for the bacteria to acquire these mutations that would make it as distinct um, as a particular particular clone. Uh, but through as well like whole genome sequencing and this genomic surveillance, we're able to see how, how quickly each specific bacteria will mutate because different bacterial species will have different mutation rates. Um, and by tracking that, we just learn more about them and learn what potential interventions could stop them adapting too well to antimicrobials or escaping vaccines or anything as such. So it's sort of like detective. You can use all of this data to see where your bacteria has been and where it's going. And, and that sounds like a very lot of data. If of yeah. a very large genome. Um, perhaps we turn to Nina to talk about, uh, um, it, it is a, a lot of data and uh, from all of this genomic work and clinical work. And I'd like to uh, perhaps have you tell, talk about um, your, how you got involved in uh, this work and, and what you're working on uh, antimicrobial resistance. Um, sure, thank you, Alice. So, um, as Alita mentioned, there is a, a large data emerged um, from uh, monitoring pathogens or when we're coming to inf uh, monitoring infection cases and infectious disease. 
Um, but gradually, we kind of like this uh, this paradigm of of surveillance work has been shifted to to track from tracking pathogens more towards um, tracking patients instead, because we kind of like now want to emphasize patient center care, and patient center care must be supported by patient care data. And sometimes we 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 restricted by the the what we call the boundaries of of settings. For example, um, we used to be challenged when there was um, less data available when patient leaving the hospital, or we don't know what we, we don't understand what patient what happened to the patient after they were being discharged, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So now it comes to a time that uh, when we are trying to track patients, um, we want to kind of like monitor the whole care pathways and understand the factors that are influencing the the impact the influencing the the effectiveness of uh, treatment and as well as health policies so this is when the large volume of um, health data can can help because traditionally when we talk about evidence-based medicine we're always looking at um, data generated from a for example a clinical trial that is that is really helpful but cannot uh, kind of like replicate exactly what's going on in real life so now we are using this kind of like real time, real life patient data that generated in, in daily practice to help us understand, first of all, how um, drug resistant pathogens emerged and transmitted, and also um, how patients react to certain treatment and policy. So this is where the data science can really help. So in our research team of population health policy, we are dealing with large volume of, of data generated across different settings um, and also nationally and internationally. And we understand that the disease transmission doesn't stop because there is a, there is a boundary between primary and secondary care. And therefore, in our research unit, we really emphasize on linking data, integrating data and analyzing them across in, um, different sectors in healthcare system. Um, also, we are working very hard to support um, local practice like um, hospital trust and also clinical groups to optimize uh, the system which we can monitor the patient better, but also we have leaner, uh, more efficient kind of way to use them. And we want to use patient data more ethical, but also effectively as well. So, and this will support kind of like the policy and redesign and also intervention redesign. That's really interesting, and and, uh, and that transmission in a hospital can be so important. You need to be fairly rapid with your analysis, I imagine. Um, and you're you're also working with WHO on on. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the global uh, view of this uh, this work and uh, your project with WHO? Sure. So um, I'm, I'm very lucky and grateful to get the support from um, NIHR and also WHO especially um, since um, the COVID pandemic, we have done um, several projects to kind of like understand how does the pandemic actually impacted um, the antimicrobial resistance and also infection cases uh, in different sectors in healthcare system, both locally and internationally. Um, so what we found uh, is we are being challenged by more healthcare associated infection cases in the um, in secondary care, in hospitals, because uh, we have more patients um, admitted during the pandemic, and also there are changes in, in, in the patient profile, but also um, local care access, and, and also how um, the, the practice, daily clinical practice as well. Um, so therefore, we really found that the, the surveillance of infection cases needs to be context specific, um, meaning you have to understand what has changed locally on the ground. And that's why I think um, having a research unit uh, like HPRU is critical because we, our research is embed, is built upon what's being observed cl clinically every day in doctor's daily practice. So it's a rapid kind of like response to what's observed on the ground. And then we use data to understand that. And then we can also feedback our, our findings quite rapidly as well to inform any changes in daily practice. Um, also, we have found in secondary care, there is a reduction in, in antimicrobial use um, since, uh, since the pandemic onset. 
Um, so um, there is a, it's a very different pattern we observe in different settings. In hospital, they, might, uh, they had an initial increase in, in antimicrobial use, while in community, we found a large reduction. It could have a positive impact on global antimicrobial resistance. However, we need to monitor closely to see, um, to avoid any unintended consequences um, associated with this reduction. And also we learned from that, the, the, the surveillance must be very, very context specific, meaning you have to understand what changing on the ground. So that's why we need the support um, from like different settings and we need real time data. We need le leaner and more efficient uh, system. And we need to understand like data set generated at both national and also institutional level. That's really fascinating. It's a very important time for a, a systems uh, approach. We've been through this incredible situation where there are a lot of people hospitalized for longer and then a lot of people who've been isolated from one another. So transmission of normal disease transmission perhaps has been lower and, uh, and it, there's a lot we don't know about how the system will respond and how these things will come back. Um, that's, uh, it seems that the work that all three of you are doing is, is critically uh, important. Um, at this juncture, I don't know. I you know I always took the lay approach that antimicrobial resistance came from um, not finishing your prescription of antibiotics, and then the bugs that are left in you get past uh, that, and, and the next time they give you antibiotics, they won't work. But I guess it's much more complicated than that. I don't know if you so, you have a sense. <laughs> yes. Can I can I um, uh, pick that up, but also expand on what Nina was saying, if that's all right, Alice? I mean, I think um, you know any exposure to uh, an antimicrobial, whether it's appropriate or inappropriate, provides a pressure. I mean, it's it's Darwinian, it's evolution. Um, you know, it's it, it it's it's we can't stop that. Um, but what we can do is try and reduce um, unnecessary exposure. I just wanted to pick up on, on, on something that um, uh, Nina said and that you kind of alluded to, but we haven't actually expressed it um, maybe thoroughly enough, which is that it's we're, we're not interested in just reducing uh, antimicrobials. That's not what we're about. We also need to recognize that, you know, access to effective antimicrobials um, worldwide is more of a challenge, um, but it's the you know, access to effective ones now and later. So um, we are really interested also in making sure that people get adequate therapy and we improve how we manage infections and improve the clinical outcomes. So, you know, we're, we're Nina's doing some really elegant work at the moment, looking at has that massive reduction in antimicrobial use in the community actually um, is this, you know, it may be very good in the long term and or, you know, its impact, but does that mask people not getting treatment when they needed it? Um, and, and we know globally, you know, the impact on TB management, the access to effective vaccines or HIV programs all being kind of compromised. So we're, we're really, you know, interested in the impact beyond just whether it causes drug resistance, but actually how can we make sure people are treated well and have access to the necessary treatment um, to manage infections? It's not just AMR, stop the antibiotics. It's much more nuanced than, than that. And I also think, as, as Nina was saying, what you were saying about needing a systems level approach for the impact of COVID, absolutely. It's, you know, just looking in one little silo is just not going to help help us. Um, so a kind of whole systems approach. Thank you. Thank you. That's very, uh, it, this is really a very important time. Um, and uh, I, I'd love to explore a little bit. We have a, a lot of people uh, thinking about what you've been uh, doing, uh, and Nina and Alita, how you've gotten drawn into working on uh, AMR. Um, Nina, you're a very analytical person. Uh, how did this, uh, uh, how did you?
I'm going to jump in there if that's all right, because I think Alice is having a few problems with her connection. Yeah. So, um, Nina, I think you need to tell us about your background, which is not so conventional. Um, and um, tell us about your your background, Nina, and how you ended up working with us all. Sure. Um, so um, I have been at Imperial for more than 10 years. However, my, my, they, they have uh, had a few big shifts um, in, my, in my academic path, if, my, if I may call it. So I initially joined um, Imperial in 2009 um, as a bioengineer because um, engineering was my original kind of like passion because I was very obsessed with um, things like, uh, like a control system or, or anything robotic related. Um, so when I joined um, bioengineering, it was a very new department. I was a second year. Um, and also there was a first year when um, the bioengineering department launched the program of synthetic biology. So back then it was all new concept of um, you know, new terminology of plasmid, you know, genome. And I was fascinated by how much an E. coli can, can, can do and to, to support, you know, new drug development you know, and testing treatment, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then I feel like, well, uh, so that was my fundamental kind of training I've gained in Imperial. It was a solid fund foundation of um, building analytic skills and getting me very comfortable to, to work every day with numbers. Um, but I feel like um, after, after I finished bioengineering, I feel I was a distant from, um, slightly distant from what's going on in real life. I mean, working in the lab and in front of computers is cool, but I don't, I don't see a way how I'm doing can be translated to, to real life in terms of, um, you know, actually helping medic, medical research or, or you know, even, even being translated into clinical practice. And therefore I made a decision to transition to, um, to a School of Public Health at Imperial. So I finished my training at Samaris Hospital um, and gained my master in public health degree. Um, it was a kind of uh, tough uh, uh, three, two years to actually kind of like completely change my, uh, my, my um, back from my engineering background to, to public health. It was very di different, but I'm very happy. I'm very happy. I, I am glad thinking back. I am very happy I made that decision. I think that's one of my, my best decisions I've ever made. Um, so yeah, so things, uh, that was a time actually building up two big interests. The first one is um, technology and data science, how can that be translated into real life um, in terms of applying implementation? And second thing is in general infectious disease and how, how does that influence human life and how does that transmit um, across human population and what does that, how do we, how do we combat that? So I, I decide to, fin after finish my Master of Public Health, I decide to carry on researching. So I did the one year researching program um, in, in um, ha Harvard Chang School of Public Health. And I came back to London and decided to pursue a PhD kind of a research program um, under Alison's supervision. I, I think I was very lucky because um, that was when I, I realized I could actually work with people coming from completely different discipline and still, I feel like I was a sponge during my PhD training. I absorbed something new every single day. And that's why I feel not just focusing on my thesis, you know, passing my late stage, you know, ticking box. Those are important hurdles or those are important milestones along the training. But more importantly is, I feel like being exposed in such an environment that I'm very happy and to, because I'm a very curious person in general. It, this is what my biggest motivation is, just staying very curious. I was curious about everything. And somehow, whenever I had a question in our research unit, I could manage to get some answer, even, even not me immediately, but I always um, get supported. Alice always tell me, okay, go talk to, you know, a clinician or a nurse or pharmacist and I always get what I want. So this is why I feel like, okay, um, after I finished my PhD training um, and then I did a few like postdoctoral program and then I realized I have to come back to this because I'm, I want to be exposed in a multidisciplinary environment Meanwhile, embedded in, 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 in a clinical setting where I can see what's going on in real life. So it was a big, a few big shifts along my academia um, pathway, but I'm very happy to be, I feel very grateful to be where I am now and just, you know, 
staying curious and getting challenged by observing some new something new every single day. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that's the story. Thank you, Nina, and thank you, Alison. Sorry for my technical difficulties. That's very inspiring on how you can change and evolve your interests. And you found we're we're so glad you found uh, what you're working on now, which seems extremely valuable for everybody. Um, Alita, please, uh, how did you get interested in this area? Yeah, so <clears throat> I was a curious as well person as, as Nina was saying, since my childhood. And when I finished my school in, in Lithuania, so I'm originally from Lithuania, and decided I want to study abroad to get exposed to different country, different culture, and also study microbiology. So I came to London, uh, started my undergrad degree in microbiology. It was very laboratory based um, degree. So it was because I really liked doing something with my hands and I thought like that would be brilliant. But of course, as part of this, we had a couple of lectures on genomics, um, on genetics, like bacterial genetics. And I thought that would sound really interesting. And the lecturer giving those lectures was very enthusiastic about these things. So I think that sparked my interest further. And as I, at that point uh, in my second year of undergrad, I wasn't sure what exactly I want to do after I graduate. I always thought maybe I want to go into pharmaceutical. So I decided to do an industry professional training placement. So for a year, I went and worked in the analytical microbiology team in one of the pharmaceutical companies. And during the time I learned lots of techniques, I met um, amazing microbiologists working there and because they saw this interest and drive in me to try new things they would give me many research projects to do something something that would be useful for them or make the testing routine testing things easier so I really like that trying to optimize things or make them a bit more efficient or actually ask questions beyond the original question as well what was the, which in first place initiated the project so during that uh, placement as well, I realized that, oh, there's more options what to do with my microbiology degree once I graduate. So I wanted to try out and explore it more. So I joined Microbiology Society, which was fantastic. As I joined as an ad undergraduate, I went to one of their conferences and I met researchers, I met postdocs, I met PhD students, and I was fascinated by lectures, the, the talks that they were giving the poster sessions. And though at that point, I didn't really knew so much. It, I was just fascinated, like how passionate they were as well about the work they were doing. And I felt like this is my type of people because I really feel like when I do something, I really do it like with all my heart. So talking to them more, what's the process and what are the options I doing then decided that I do want to do research and I want to apply for PhD I just need to find the program that would fit me best would it be more laboratory based or computational or just so many options so I was lucky enough as well during that conference to meet someone from now UK health security agency then at the time they were a health protection agency and they offered me a summer placement during that summer placement I got to dip my toes into this molecular epidemiology um, thing. So see how sequencing specific genes of Bartella pertussis was informing actually their policy and how it actually helps for the pub public health point of view and how, how it informs tracking like vaccines and efficiency and, and all that stuff. And I'm kind of like, that's definitely where I want to specialize a bit more. So I applied for to do a PhD on genomics in in University of Southampton, and my PhD was partly based at Singapore, so I went to Genome Institute of Singapore, where I did all my computational training, and worked with large data set um, of Streptococcus pneumonia, and basically decided that actually I'm really enjoying the com computational side of the. <clears throat> of the research and analysis, and of course, with my background in the laboratory, I was feeling that I was able to bring a new insight into analyzing the data or solving problems with the data when that arise as, as you analyze it. And then after my PhD, I, I saw the advertisement for the postdoc in uh, 
HP, the first HPU that we had in, in Imperial, and it was working on multiple, multiple bacteria with multidisciplinary teams. And I just thought like, this is definitely what I want to do. And it's kind of, yeah, I stayed here. And now I'm as well a research lead for one of these themes with which just allows me to work very closely with a lot of a lot of colleagues from various backgrounds and I just love our interactions and talking about science and that feeling that hopefully what we're doing really makes a difference at some point if not immediately then maybe in the future and it's just fascinating. That's great well all three of you uh, your your pathways and your enthusiasm and your uh, dedication are really exciting and your and your openness to taking on new challenges and and absorbing new ideas uh, is really inspiring. Um, I want to encourage our audience to submit questions. We have a couple of questions, uh, one on AMR and one on women in STEM. So uh, let me read those. And so you'll have a chance to think about them. Uh, one from, from uh, Oliver Charity, uh, as a scientist, it's obvious how I can play a role in reducing AMR and helping the silent pandemic. What can non-scientists do to help in aid of reducing AMR? And then a question also to be thinking of from Cheris Andrew, who's watching today. Uh, what would you say was the biggest challenge you had to face working as a woman in a STEM field? So um, first to um, AMR and, and how, can, uh, how can some of the people listening to us uh, help us uh, with this, um, Allison? If I, yeah, I, why don't I start with that first question from, um, I think it's Oliver, and then um, Nina and Alita can pick up that question from Karis. So in, in terms of non-scientists, well, well, you know, Alita and Nina were both talking about multidisciplinary. So actually, um, non-scientists from the research and academic field can be completely involved. Um, you don't have to have done science to have a role in tackling and addressing this. You can come from all sorts of backgrounds. But in terms of, of, of the role of the public and society, well, that's absolutely critical. I mean, things will not be sustained unless civil society get behind that. Uh, you know, I, I, I talked about climate change earlier. I mean, th that, you know, politicians may come and go. It's civil society making something a priority. Um, and, and, and being committed to thinking about, you know, you want healthcare for yourself um, in, you know, all sorts of circumstances, you'll want it for your family, you'll want it for your children, you'll want it for your parents, you'll want it for it. So, you know, we're going to want to make the most of, of, of what medicine can bring and do to society. And um, we should all have a role. I mean, I think it's it may be different ways of engaging different um, communities and different uh, contexts. I, I mentioned before, actually, that, that, you know, around the world, it's access, but it's access to effective antimicrobials. And, and really, you know, this is an issue, too, of equity. And then I can just make a kind of plug. If you are really interested, please have a look at our um, website or our Twitter handle. I think it's at HPRU AMR. We've got an amazing colleague called Julia Alabone who leads a huge program on kind of public engagement and awareness. And we really love to work with you. Um, and I'm gonna leave the, um, the, the second question Women I think, I think that, I mean, that's a great point that uh, we do quite a bit of public engagement and education and having people bring others along and, and uh, engaging uh, in our festival, uh, the Great Exhibition Road Festival next July, but also in between times. And we will put perhaps some links uh, in our follow-up materials or in the chat. Uh, the other question was, uh, the, what was the biggest challenge you had to face working as a woman in a STEM field? Um, you're slightly different uh, generations. <laughs> um, I don't know, Allison, you want to take the lead on that one also? No, I'm going I'm to let the, the, younger, the younger generation talk about that. Um, I'm, I'm happy to come back to that, but why don't, why don't we hear from what Elita and Nina's views are on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to start, Nina, if you don't mind. Um, so I guess for me, 
um, it would be as I as I now transition from early career researcher to mid career researcher, which coincides with that time in your life when you do have family. So uh, maybe it's more a challenge, not necessary to me as a woman in STEM or in general in academia, but to any young any parent to a young child the generation is managing your time and kind of like the transition that transition that you need to be more efficient and effective with your time as you actually can't necessarily do extra work there and there as might sometimes you want to or need to and of course the sleep deprivation and sometimes the low energy levels however i really want to highlight how important it is to kind of surround yourself with, with supportive people and as well provide that support to others going through maybe similar stages because by supporting each other, we make through it as that's only like a, a stage, a phase in, in a life. And one of the things working in AMR and multidisciplinary teams, which really, really helps that you get that support and you're able to be open and honest with your colleagues. And it's it's amazing how much support you get and understanding and tolerance of that, that sometimes you might be not necessarily on time, but you will try your best. And it, it's nice to hear that, you know, what you're doing is enough and good. And I say like, it's important as well to give it back. So we do have in our department and our unit as well, like specific uh, parents, little groups that with similar age, children something that we can share um maybe difficult advice and and just meet each other for coffee because we all clearly need it some days more more than others that's nice and very good message to find uh, mentors and supporters in each of your communities and you both uh entered new scientific communities and uh, and found those connections perhaps nina would you like to comment um, sure. So um, I have to be very honest about myself speaking out for my own experience. And is I, I actually, uh, it doesn't really matter is my role as a student or a, a staff or a son, young scientist at Imperial College. Like I, I, I didn't feel that I, it was a it was a huge challenge to being a female in, in the STEM field, I have to say. Um, I remember when I firstly joined, yes, there was a bit of like uh, gender, in, I wouldn't say imbalance, but engineering was heavily male dominated. When I joined, I was talking, I'm talking about more than 10 years ago. I remember mechanical engineering was uh, the most male dominant. It was a boys club and, you know, especially when there are heavy mechanical lab work, and you need a bit of muscle to do all that. But I think things have changed rapidly and now it's it's very different now. And you see female shining every area, I have to say every aspect, every field and um, and coming becoming a staff. And I don't feel that either. I, 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 I do realize that how much it's being recognized and respected here. And, you know, the diversity, the gender, it wasn't it wasn't an issue at all. I never actually feel gender or background or has been a has been a um, has been a hurdle for me to achieve anything because here we are purely recognized by by our work i have to say you know how much we're delivering and also how much we're contributing to the team and also personality etc but but never the gender or the race so um i have to say because um I have been frequently asked, how do you feel in general working and coming from Asian background, being a female in, in, in data science or in epidemiology, et cetera. But speaking for myself, I'm based on sample size of one, it was never an issue for me um, longer than 10 years here. So I think um, coming back to Alita's point that it's very important to have a strong mentorship or getting supported, you just need to find a the the way to be to be surrounded by the the right people and they support you and also as a team as well so that's my my experience yeah that's good to hear um and i i wonder if uh, i think we get some school children uh tuning in and if you think back to yourself when you were in school um what would you say you know to uh school children we've heard about your drive your curiosity um, and maybe that is the watchword, but um, you all have, uh, each of you perhaps have quick advice uh, for uh, younger students. 
yes i'm happy as well so it's like don't give up try try something new and just go because at the end of the day you have nothing to lose you worst case scenario just go to the beginning that the stage where before you took that decision to try it but if you try it you might discover so much more than you maybe at first envision so no same here just stay very curious and always ask questions i feel like at the beginning you will find like nothing actually makes sense but just keep pursuing that keep asking questions and one day everything you know you will find what clicks eventually and gradually you will find your your niche or your 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 passion where you're passionate about and just keep pursuing that just stay curious stay keep asking questions thank you and uh allison please yeah, stay being interested, enthusiastic, but also be flexible. Things change, life changes, circumstances change. You can shift around things, but you know, keep staying interested and pursue what your uh, where your interest lies. And but be flexible. And and if you want to work in this field in the broadest sense. Remember, you'll be doing something that will be of vital importance to you and society, you know, now and forever. So it's an important area to get involved in. And no matter what your talent is, you know, you will be important and, con and can contribute. And um, um, we will welcome you here, um, but be flexible. Those are great messages. You've all embraced change in your careers thus far, and it's uh, it really has paid off. And uh, I guess just as bacteria evolve, uh, we need to evolve, if I may make a very poor joke there. Uh, we have another question from the audience. And, and again, back to um, antibiotic uh, medication, uh, someone asking about how much poor adherence to antibiotic medication is contributing to drug resistance. How good are we in assessing patients' adherence to antibiotics? Um, and I might like to ask a corollary about agriculture because I've heard a bit about that. But uh, do you, um, you have a lot of data on um, hospital transmission and such? I guess in the hospital, you definitely adhere because you're given the medications. Um, how much so, is this an issue? So I, I'll, um, I, I'm going to work backwards, I think. Um, so agriculture and um, yeah, really, so, so an incredibly important aspect. And, and one of the things we haven't touched upon here is the whole kind of one health concept, which is looking about looking at how antimicrobials are used uh, across, uh, across society, um, in the environment, in the food production industry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, we're mostly focused on human health, so that's largely our focus. But we absolutely recognize that, you know, in terms of policy and addressing it globally, we need a one health perspective. Um, I, I would make the point that, uh, that you know, something that Nina mentioned, that actually within humans, we're not very good at actually looking across all of healthcare. So it's all very well that we need to look at food production, livestock and the environment, but actually within healthcare, we need to be a little bit more joined up in terms of looking at the whole healthcare economy, um, not just people that are in you know, intensive care in hospital, but all of us we need, we, we need to look at. Um, so yeah, but, but there's amazing work being done on reducing antimicrobial use in livestock and food production. Some really amazing work being done there. Then the bit about adherence, um, yes, that's, that can be a challenge, but we also know that for some infections, we can go to shorter and shorter courses. Um, and then the work that we're doing that we touched on a little bit about how can we really, really improve our knowledge of dosing and make it absolutely precise for that individual and for that infection at that time is work that we're really promoting and getting our teeth into. With, with, with colleagues um, across the college. Yeah, that's very exciting. It seems that ability to not overuse is just as important as getting patients to finish the course that they've been prescribed. Um, to prescribe it correctly in the first place is critically, you're finding is critically important. Um, and 
your one health comment is so uh, important. I remember a couple of years ago, our colleagues uh, finding that the uh, antifungal um, resistance is becoming uh, quite frightening. And I know there are a lot of antifungals used in agriculture. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's really beautiful work. And, and when we say the work on antimicrobial resistance, so Nina, Alita, and I have been focusing on antibacterials, but actually the work extends beyond antibacterials, antifungals, what you're referring to, azole usage in the environment has had a big impact. And there's, we're, you know, we've got fantastic colleagues here at Imperial that are actually doing beautiful work around that. But we're also interested in how can we use diagnostics better? And that's not just for bacterial infections, but that's for diagnosing viral infections to make sure that we don't use antibiotics when we don't need them. Um, and, you know, from, as I said, parasites um, in terms of like um, uh, malaria infections, fungal infections. We have a major problem with resistant fungal infections in, in, in healthcare, and the link that to the environment is, is really important. Thank you. We're running uh, towards the end of our time. I'd just like to perhaps end with a little bit of opportunity to sum up and let each of you perhaps uh, talk a little bit about uh, the future. Uh, at Imperial, of course, we've just launched our Institute of Infection, and there are tremendous opportunities uh, to do what Allison did so boldly a few years ago, bringing people together from across disciplines to make sure we have those uh, very sensitive technologies to detect and measure and study and treat um, uh, infections and, um, and modeling and all of, all of the work from across campus. In addition, of course, our School of Public Health is coming together in, in White City in a new building that will also have that very collaborative and multidisciplinary approach, also working very closely with the community and the communities around there. Um, so I guess I would just ask you all what uh, you are excited about uh, in the future. And uh, is there, if there were a wish list of things that you could have or see invested in, what would make the biggest difference to you? <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll jump in and start. And I think we need to be, um, I think we need to um, broaden our work with our international collaborators and really develop a much more global equitable approach to our research and also um, the priorities. And um, I'm really looking forward to doing much more of that. I think it's really important that we bring the lessons of public health into healthcare a lot more. Um, and um, and, and uh, I, I'm really keen on, keen on that. And we are going to be developing the Center of Antimicrobial Optimization um, and launching that in, in January. And I hope we will be able to develop international networks and fellowships around that so we can learn from colleagues across across the globe and um, do a little bit more around equitable research and um, how to benefit further populations. And that's, that's fabulous. We'll watch for that launch. And so Alina and Nina, you have 30 seconds each. Uh, what, what's your wish for the future? <laughs> Um, I guess with them um, thinking about bacterial genomics and evolution, of course, like more, more sequencing to be done so we can really understand pathogens better and share the data, as Alison mentioned as well, not only from high income countries, but as well with every country in the world so we can work against antimicrobial resistance together, but specifically addressing as well specific issues each of the countries is having. Thank you, Nina leaner and more efficient data that allow uh, not just uh, support any research, but also allow patients to access data, their own data ethically, adequately and safely. Great, thank you. Thank you all. This has been fascinating and we wish you well with your work. It's very important and uh, we feel uh, that we're getting a safer and, and better world all the time with uh, work like yours. So thank you, and, and I'd like to just invite our audience to tune in again. Um, our next uh, conversation will be with Professor Claudia Duram, uh, Professor of Theoretical Physics and Heba Jamal, second year physics student. How do we communicate with the universe? And that'll be on Tuesday, the 16th of November. I uh, look forward to seeing you then. Thank you, goodbye.